Good day, everyone. My name is Christian Sasse. I'm the astronomer in charge for iTelescope. I'm so delighted to see you to this very exciting webinar. I would like to introduce our guest once again, Andrea Luna Pizzetti. She's both Italian, European, and she's also in North America now, actually. So Andrea Luna, I don't know if you see me, but I'm going to wait a moment for you to appear. <laughs> she's probably, she might have some computer problems. There you are. Very nice to see you again. So Andrea Luna is from Clemson University in South Carolina. Is there anybody else from South Carolina? So she is both the Europeans from the Italian side. We were talking about the wonderful cafes they have in Europe, which we miss very much in North America. And also she is nearing the, the completion of her PhD. It's still a few months to go, but you know how difficult all this is. Anyway, four months ago, and I've just put the link in, Andrea Luna was talking about black holes and revelations. It was very exciting. So be, please take a look at that and take a look at all the other really very informative webinars that we've had. It's It's been quite an interesting community, and I think we have a lot of good value there. So please don't miss out just going through them. Everything we do there for education is free. Andrea Luna, now to you and the very interesting talk on Seaford galaxies. So it's about very active galaxies. So it's very exciting. So I'm going to hand it over to you without any further ado. All right. Thank you, Christian. Uh, yeah. So as Christian says, I'm, so I'm Andrea Luna. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here again on my second talk. Um, so last time I gave more a more... Um, background kind of talking where um I was talking about how like we create like we go from star forming region to uh black holes and supermassive black holes and today's talk is going to be more about um what I do in my research here at Clemson as Christian said um I am from Europe I'm Italian I'm from Italy I, I got my bachelor degree in uh, astronomy at the University of Bologna and then in 2019 I moved here in the United States where I'm pursuing my PhD in physics and hopefully at the end of these academic year so by May 2024 I'll be done <laughs> with this damn PhD <laughs> all right let me share my screen and we can start okay so today talk is going to be about how x-rays reveal the secrets in Seaford 2 galaxies uh don't worry if you haven't heard if you have never heard about Seaford 2 galaxies because I'm going to talk about them today I'm going to explain you what they are so this is um um, this is an outline of um, today's presentation. I'm going to give you an AGN background. Uh, so we're going to talk about active galactic nuclei and understand what they are and why do we care about them. And then I'll talk to you about the line of sight variability project that it's actually what I'm working on right now here in Clemson. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to explain to you the method, uh, what has been done and the work in progress. So let's start with the aim of my research. So why do I care and why do I am doing the research I am doing? So uh, the whole point uh, is to understand the geometry and the morphology of AGN obscuring material using uh, X-ray variability study. So um, my research focuses on the, uh, on the use of X-rays um, and so X-ray data I collect, collect not I collect, collected by X-ray telescopes that are orbiting, of course, because we know X-ray cannot penetrate the, um, the atmosphere, thankfully. <laughs> um, and so I use data from X-ray telescope to study the variability of uh, these sources I'm going to talk to you about right now, because we need uh, to better understand their structure, the inner structure and um, the geometry and the morphology. Let's remember that uh, our galaxy, the Milky Way, was an active galaxy year, many years ago. Uh, that means that as active galaxy, we mean a galaxy that is accreting matter that has a supermassive black hole at its center and the supermassive black hole is accreting matter. So the Milky Way has a supermassive black hole at the, at the center, but right now, uh, Sagittarius A star, that's the name of the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way, it's not... Um, accreting matter but it was in the past so we 
And so uh, we are analyzing galaxies in the nearby universe, so kind of close by, astronomically speaking, who are accreting matter at their center, and we try to understand what is the structure uh, of the matter surrounding the supermassive black hole. Okay, let's start with asking yourself, what is a, this AGN I've been talking to, I've been talking about? So an AGN is an active galactic nuclei, and as I said before, it means that we have a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy that is accreting matter. Uh, in here, in this slide, we have a schematic uh, cartoon, a schematic representation of uh, how AGN look like. Um, in all AGN, we have these features, this common feature. We have a supermassive black hole at the center. We have an accretion disk of th that is basically made of matter, a gas that is accreting onto the supermassive black hole. We have clouds close to the accretion disk that are called uh, that form the so-called broad line region. And it, uh, we call it that way because the optical spectra that comes from the gas in that region has broadened lines. These liners are broadened because since the gas is so close to the, um, the gas is moving faster, uh, is moving very fast since it's so close to the uh, black hole. Above and below the accretion disk, we have the uh, corona. It's uh, the hot corona is um, a structure made of relativ relativistic electrons. Um, and this structure will remember these things because we, I remember the corona because we will uh, come back on this structure. Um, the actual size and dimension and uh, uh, geometry of the corona is still an open question in, um, in astrophysics. We know it's there, but we don't really know uh, what is the size and the shape of the structure. And there are studies that are more related to this. Around uh, all of this, we have the torus. A torus, as the name, um, this is that donut-like shape. Uh, so uh, the, uh, we have this toroidal structure made of gas and dust that obscures, uh, covers the inner part, the innermost part of the um, galactic nuclei. Then farther away, we have the narrow line region, the NLR. Um, and again, here in narrow line region, because when we take an optical spectra of this region, we see that the lines are narrow. When uh, we were talking about the road line region, in this case, we have gas that's closer to the black hole. It's hotter there, it's warmer. So we have gas moving faster and the, line, the emission lines are broadened. While in this case, the gas is still excited, but since it's farther away from the black hole, the temperature are a bit less and the uh, lines are narrow. And then in 10% of the cases, we have jets. Uh, so jets can be there, but like, as I said, as just said, only in 10% of the cases, we have uh, active galactic nuclei with jets. Uh, depending on whether they have jets or not, and on the line of and the and the, on the angle of viewing of, of the observation angle, AGN can be classified in different ways. So, uh, if uh, we have a certain um, uh, usually when we have jets, they are called radio loud galaxies, and when they are when they don't have jets, they are called radio quiet, or radio quiet even if they may have a jet, but that jet is not that powerful. In the case we have radio loud uh, galaxies, we call them blazer when we are looking directly through the jet. So basically, in that in those galaxies, the only thing we can see is the jet that's pointing toward the Earth. Uh, when we are looking uh, on an inclination angle that is around like 30, 45 degrees, we call them radio loud quasars. And when we uh, don't look, when we are actually looking them basically at dawn, we call them radio galaxies. Um, in the case we don't have jets, those galaxies are called Seifert galaxies, and they uh, are divided in Seifert 1 and Seifert 2s. Um, we call them Seifert 1 if you are able to see the inner part 
of the uh, of the galaxy. So we actually uh, that we are the this the torus is not obscuring our line of sight, and we can actually see the broad line region and the accretion disk directly. While we call them Cipher twos, in the case we have the uh, we are in we have um, the torus obscuring the inner part of the galaxy. On the optical point of view, this is the spectra of a Cipher 1 and a Cipher 2. And remember, as I said before, so is Cipher 2 is in the case of Cipher 1, we are able to see the in the most the innermost part of the AGN. And indeed, in the optical spectra, we have these broad lines. You see how these lines are actually broadened with respect to the others, while these are the narrow line. In the case of Cipher 2, is instead, since the um, the the inner part, the the innermost part of the galaxy, are um, obscured by the, the by the torus, we don't see the broad line region. And indeed, in the optical spectra, we only have narrow line region. So this is how you get actually. This is how the the uh, how the classification uh, come from uh, is done. Looking at optical spectra and see when we have narrow line, then it means it's a Cipher 2. Uh, sorry, when we have a broad line, then it means it's a Cipher 1. And then when we don't see um, broad line, but on a narrow line, then we have Cipher 2s. There is all another stuff. <laughs> we also have an all other um, between Cipher 1 and Cipher 2s. There are like all other classification because we can have uh, narrow lines, Cipher 1. So it, but I'm not going to go into this uh, further details as we are, as um, as me and my team, my team and I, like my team, the re research group I'm working with and I are interested in C for two galaxies. So in this one, in where we know that the torus is obscuring the uh, inner part because we want to uh, understand what's going on in the torus, what is its structure and what it's made of. Um, Seifert two galaxies are further classified into subclasses again, uh, depending on the density of the gas, uh, depending on the column density of the gas that uh, it's uh, in the torus. So if uh, when this gas has a column density that's above 10 to the 22 per centimeter squared, we call them obscured AGN or Compton thin. AGN. And when the density increases and goes above 10 to the 24 per centimeter squared, then we call them Compton thick AGN. Okay. So uh, these are the uh, the two for the classification. And, and so this is where I'm going to refer to Compton thin or Compton thick, depending on whether the density is above 10, to, is between 10 to the 22 and 10 to the 24, then it's a Compton thin. When it's above 10 to the 24 is a Compton thick AGN. But let's now see how the obscure material reprocess the radiation, because that's what we are actually looking at, right? So we have the accretion disk here, this red line here, that is emitting uh, a multicolor black body in the ultraviolet. So the accretion disk principally mainly emits in ultraviolet. This ultraviolet um, radiation gets absorbed and re-emitted by the dust in the torus. So ultraviolet radiation gets absorbed by the dust and re-emitted in infrared. And uh, this ultraviolet radiation gets upscattered via inverse Compton scattering uh, by the relativistic electrons in the hot corona, I was saying before. And this is how X-rays ge get generated. So the X-ray I am observing gets generated this way by the upscattering of the UV uh, L, um, photons generated by the um, accretion disk. These X-rays then get reprocessed by the torus in three different ways. They get reflected, they get transmitted, uh, and scattered. So reflection is has its size. So like uh, in this case, electrons, the photons get uh, reflected by the, um, like, like if there was a mirror, right? 
they get reflected by the uh, the dust and the gas in the torus and in the accretion disk. In the case of a transmission, these um, basically the, uh, the some of the photons get photoabsorbed by the uh, gas particle in the torus and begin get re-emitted. And then some of them can just pass through the torus without interacting with anything. And this is the scattering component. But let's look at them one um, in a single way to clarify a bit this thing. So we have um, the, in the, in the transmission is, um, as I was saying, it's uh, telling us about the X-ray photons, which get photo absorbed and re-emitted. Uh, they get for sorry, not re-emitted. They get photo absorbed by the gas in the um, uh, in the um, in the torus. These in here, in here, this is the X-ray spectra. Okay, that's due to the transmission. So we see that first of all okay um we see this number here in the x axis this is these are these are the energy of the electric of the photons in kilo electron volt when we have electric photons in this part of the spectra we call them soft x rays and when they goes above 5 10 keV then we talk about hard x rays so we see here how the transmission component peaks uh, in the soft X-ray part of the spectrum. And by modeling the transmission component, we can actually get information on what is the density of the gas that's between us and the, um, and the X-ray emitter. So when we analyze, when we get data, X-ray data, we have, we can model this data to get information about what is the gas between us and the uh, X-ray emitter. Uh, in this case, we are going to talk about line of sight, then column density, because it's the density of the gas that is in our line of sight, and it's between us and the, uh, the X-ray emitter. Uh, in here, you can see how this is a powerful tool, um, how this uh, uh, component, it's very sensitive to change in density. So for example, this is 10 to the 23, this is 0 0.5, 10 to the 24, and this is 10 to the 24. So basically just like one order of magnitude difference and we, you can see how the spectra is completely different. So by um, this is a powerful uh, way to understand what is the gas, uh, the density of the gas. And this is a quantity we expect to change. And I will uh, I will explain this a bit better later. But let, let's remember about this because uh, this tracks the density of the gas in our line of sight. The torus reflects also the uh, X-ray photons that comes uh, that get the, that gets generated via Compton uh, scattering. This time, not inverse Compton, but Compton scattering, and it generates what is called a Compton hump. Uh, in the hard X-ray part of the spectrum. You see here, we are in the 10, 20 kilo electron volt. Uh, and we also have some emission lines. So basically, you see this, um, um, this step here. This is where you see this step in the energy because this is where the iron get absorbed absorbs uh, the majority of photons, and then the iron emits emission lines. And these are the iron emission lines that you can you see in the reflection, um, the, in the um, reflection component of the X-ray spectrum. Uh, as the, com the transmission component is giving us information on the density of the gas in our line of sight, uh, the, by modeling the Compton hump and the reflection, component of the X-ray spectra, we get information about the overall density. What is the average density of the torus itself? We have information on that, on the opening angle. So basically we can tell how um, geometrically thick the torus is and how physically thick in the sense like we can actually get some uh, information on the overall density. 
since the uh, the uh, reflection is giving an is giving us information about overall quantities of the torus itself we don't expect this quantity to change with time at least not like in a short time scale uh, of like 20 30 years and at the end we have the scattering component that as I was telling you before is just amount of um uh, radiation that passes through the torus without interacting or interacting elastically with the, the gas particles inside that. So basically what we see here is just the main power. It's just a power law that is uh, what is generated by the inverse component, in, inverse component scattering. So basically it, this has the same shape. It's telling us what is the shape of the radiation at the, uh, the moment it was generated. Okay, so when we put together all these three components, the transmission, the reflection, and the scattering, we get what is the observed spectrum of uh, uh, AGN in the X-rays. Uh, and it's this black line. I didn't mention the, the, uh, the this thermal emission, this magenta, the, uh, the, the magenta here. Um, this is a component we actually see in the X-ray spectra of an AGN, but I didn't mention it before because it doesn't depend on the AGN itself, but is the emission that comes from the host galaxy. So this is the hot gas in the hot, uh, in the host galaxy. Uh, so like we have thermal Bram Stralung and uh, emission lines that peaks like in the soft part of the X-ray spectra. So we see them, but they they don't depend on the X-ray on the on the um, AGN itself. So you can see how one order of magnitude difference in the density of the torus actually gives two completely different uh, X-ray spectra. So basically what we do is we model the X-ray spectra and we get information on the geometry on the um, and on the geometry, on the um, geometrical thickness of the torus, and on the overall densities, and on the density of the clouds that are of the gas that is between us and the X-ray emitter. So let's talk about a second about the morphology of the obscuring material. So at the beginning, um, uh, it was thought like. Um, this uh, torus uh, was is was assumed to be uh, homogeneous, and this is because assuming something homogeneous in such a, a um, difficult in such a, a complicated structure, it's the easiest way to go with to go to. But then observations are telling us that these the torus is not homogeneous at all, but is clumpy. It's made of clouds of different densities. We have. Um, the first um, um, insight about that was given by Krolik and Bagelman in 1988, um, in where they they were the first to conclude that the torus is likely to be clumpy rather than homogeneous, and uh, uh, that the geometrical thickness was kept by viscous heating, so it's a cloud to cloud interaction. I may say that the ge like the reason on the geometrical thickness, so the dynamics of the clouds in the torus is still a big open question in a in the astrophysical community. I mean, we still do not have any uh, physical model that explains why, like in a very strong way, why the torus is actually uh, it's thick. And uh, because the models that are now actually um, yeah, you can start with a thick torus, but you that torus it's gonna eventually collapse in <laughs> at least this is what simulation showed. Uh, so basically, we don't really we don't really know what is the dynamics behind the um, the geometrical thickness of the torus. We know it's like that, but we don't know why. And the one and this is one of the things like that is aiming my research a lot. Um, then Rizaliti. In uh, 2002 and 2005, in two papers, he uh, show, he saw rapid Compton thin Compton thick uh, transition in uh, a CIFR2 galaxy, NGC 1365, uh, and these also suggesting that the absorber, um, that so the the absorber, the the 
the, the clouds that are absorbing the, uh, the radiation may must be very close to the center. Um, but still, this, these are all just the suggestions that are telling us, okay, maybe it's, it's very likely the torus is clumpy and it's not a homogeneous structure. Uh, Scartman et al. in 2005 found different uh, temperature of the dust because remember that the torus is made of gas and dust. We, in my case, in my research, I'm more interested in the dust, uh, but there is um, actually we have one of the uh, um, guys today here, uh, one of the, the other participant of the talk that is um, um, with my colleague in Bologna and he's more inter interested in the dust. He does AGN, but like on the infrared point of view. So let's remember that uh, we have also the dust. And uh, if we study the torus in infrared, we see that we have different uh, dust temperatures found at the same radii. And this is possible only if we have clouds. If the, uh, the medium is homogeneous, then at each uh, radii, you should have one, only one, uh, one or like very small range of temperature of uh, dust. Uh, how at all? Also, there is this uh, shallow 10 micrometer absorption feature in, a, in AGN that is another hint of a clumpy scenario. Indeed, if the, um, if the torus wasn't uh, clumpy, you would expect this uh, absorption feature to be much narrower. And then finally, uh, in, uh, in 2008, Nenkova uh, was the first to propose um, um, an infrared model for clumpy torus that was actually able to reproduce observations. And the majority of X-rays um, models are based on this Nenkova 2008 model. Um, Zhao, uh, um, Shuri Zhao is a former uh, ex, um, PhD student here at Clemson, um, and he worked analyzing uh, ha, more than a ha, hundred of C42 galaxies. And what he saw is that uh, the the main, I mean, the main um, results uh, of his of his study was that. One of his main, one of the one of the main results of the study is that uh, you have the 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 average uh, um, density that you find in, in the torus in the tori is different than the line of sight column density that you get. So basically, what it's telling us is that um, if the if the torus was um, an homogeneous structure you would expect to have the overall density to be the same as the line of sight density of the clouds. I mean, if the, if the structure is homogeneous, the density of the clouds that you have that are between you and the center should be the same as the density of the old torus. But what we actually see is that, in, and, and what we see in a systematic way, is that when you calculate the density of the, the uh, overall of the torus and you um and the dense and the density of the clouds that are between you in, in the line of sight these two density are different are different and this is an, another suggestion that the torus is actually clumpy and it's not um homogeneous so the whole objective of this work is that is the torus is indeed clumpy we expect to see variability in the line of sight called hydrogen column density over time. That means that if we take more uh, more observations taking a different time, we would expect to see the uh, line of sight density to change with time. So um, we took, uh, we started from the, um, the, the sample of uh, Shuri Zhao in 2021, which, and we took 30 galaxies of which, um, and 30, 30, gal 30 of these galaxies showed to have variability, and we started a more detailed study. Um, 
So before uh, we go and talk about the actual study, let me talk about the method that we use to analyze these galaxies. So to analyze, we did um, all the galaxies um, have been analyzed by taking uh, the X-ray um, um, observation that needed to be more than three if you want to see uh, some variability. Um, and these uh, X-ray observation needs to be both in the soft and in a hard X-ray of this uh, X, uh, soft and hard X-ray part of the spectrum to get the uh, components I'll show you before. Then uh, all these observations were analyzed simultaneously with three different models. In this way, we are sure that our results are not model dependent. Um, Two of the model we're using, Mitorus and Borus, consider um, a homogeneous torus, while the Ux clumpy is the only model that we use, that, uh, one of the only model available also, uh, that uh, considers that uh, the torus to be clumpy. Uh, on the first, why these two are, I mean, why, if we know that the torus is not clumpy, it is clumpy, why do we still use models to assume the torus not to be clumpy, but homogeneous? Because on the first, the, or the approximation, the reflection component doesn't change whether the torus is clumpy or not. And both of them have a feature that uh, let us calculate the, what is the line of sight? So like, what is the density of the clouds? of the torus. The main difference between these two is the geometrical configuration they're taking into account. This is like this is a, an actual uh, torus with an opening angle fixed. So in this case we cannot change we cannot tell how thick is the torus because the torus size, uh, size um is fixed while borus let us understand let us give gives us information on the geometrical thickness of the torus itself. Uh, in Ux Glumpy, we have actually more information on the clouds distribution. So I'll start talking about the pilot project that was about NGC 7479. Uh, NGC 7479 is a, a CIFR 2 galaxy distance uh, the, with a distance of 36.1 megaparsec in the constellation Peg uh, Pegasus. So 36.1 megaparsec, astronomically speaking, is like this is a very close by, uh, is a very nearby galaxy. Um, we needed, uh, for this galaxy, six observations were available in the archive. And as I was telling you before, uh, we needed both uh, soft and hard X-rays. So soft observation, we got the, the soft observation from Chandra and XMM Newton, that are two uh, X-ray telescopes and hard X-ray observation were provided by Neuster, that's another X-ray telescope. And in all of these, we had the time span of 20 years. And so these are the results we, uh, we got. So in the left panel, we have the X-ray spectra of NGC 7479 as modeled by Borus. Um, in here, I highlighted the three components I showed you before, so the transmission, the scattering, and the reflection. The different colors are the different data point from the uh, um, the three different the six different observations. So we have Neuster, X, uh, and X, Mem, and Chandra here. So that's the the color the color code, and the green line is the overall best fit model that we got for this galaxy for borders at least. On the, la on the right panel here, we have how the line of sight column density changes with time. So here in here, we have the column density and here we have time. And these data points are the points we got from the six different observations. The three color uh, define the three models. And you see that how the three models actually uh, the within errors, they all agree within each other. The, uh, and the, the different shape of the markers uh, define the three different telescopes that we used. These two lines here, the orange and the magenta one, are uh, define the average column density of the torus. 
as uh, modeled by Borus and uh, Mytorus. I have to say that UX Clumpy is not here because at that time, uh, UX Clumpy is, um, doesn't allow to um, calculate the average column density of the torus. But I'm working with the, um, um, with Johannes Buchten, that is a developer of uh, UX Clumpy. And uh, actually we are, We'll, a paper will be published soon on this new feature that is like allow you to calculate the to generate the average column density of the torus uh, with UX Clump. So let's see what information we can get from these two uh, plots. So first of all, here we see that the average column density of the torus lies above the single clouds density. So this gives us two information. One, these two are different. So it means the torus is clumpy. If the torus was homogeneous, these two quantities would be the same. Second, we have that the overall torus is much more denser than the clouds that create the torus. And so how is that possible? And here I will explain you in the next slide. We can actually see this in the spectra in where we have the reflection component that is above the transmission component. That means that this is what we call a reflection dominated spectra. And we have these when we have heavily Compton thick uh, sources. So as you can see here, this is 10 to the 24. So we are in the Compton thick regime. We only have this observation that may go below, but yeah, like with the narrow, we don't know where actually it is. And we see, that the cloud's density is changing with time. Again, if the torus was um, homogeneous, this quantity wouldn't change with time and it would be the same as the average column density of the torus. In here, we have uh, a, a schematic cartoon of what the torus of NGC 7479 we think looks like. Um, the image is not is not to scale, of course, but these are kind of like the uh the, the we we know that the torus should have a, uh, um should be within the the, the fifty uh fifty seventy uh parsec from the inner like the the black hole. Uh, we have the store sigma you see here. This is the clouds distribution as we got from UX Lumpy. Uh, these angles you see here are the opening angle of the torus and the observing angle we got from the model. And then here I was uh, asked, I asked myself, me, uh, you, <laughs> this question how is it possible that the torus itself is much denser than the clouds? that are generate that are forming it and here we have what we think it's the answer uh here uh so um ux clumpy uh a model allow us to include this inner ring of compton thick clouds uh with the, the column density that's above 10 to the 25 per centimeter square uh that it's supposed to be the cause of the reflect the strong reflection component we actually see in the spectra. Uh, this inner part here is called inner ring, but uh, we actually don't know whether the inner ring is there. What is a shape? What is its shape? If it's actually a ring, if it's a disk, we don't know. So what we did was like to um ask for ALMA time last year and this year. And last year I got accepted, this year I didn't, but it's okay, I'm gonna try again next year. Uh, we ask for time to directly uh, image the inner ring since ALMA is the only facility that uh, actually has the angular resolution uh, that can actually reach the angular resolution we need. And this is just a very preliminary result uh, as the ALMA observation got, um, they started uh, at the beginning of um, August. And here you see this is a 4.8 parsec structure. So like what we are seeing here is part is the inner part of the torus of NGC 7479. 
uh, okay, these are very like new uh, um, observation uh, images, but like, yeah, hopefully we can actually, with this observation, we can actually tell whether there is an inner ring or not. But in any case, uh, analyzing this uh, uh, observation will at least tell us something, because if we don't see anything, that means the structure maybe can be smaller than that. So it can give us upper limits at least. Uh, from, okay, uh, from uh, the, um, another information we can get from uh, the uh, spectrum and for, from the change in the line of sight column density is actually having a sort of the size um, of where the clouds are, like the, the distance of the clouds from the, um, um, X-ray emission region. Um, these are not okay. These are not very good uh, example because okay. So do to do this, and this is a, an this is the equation you have to apply. Uh, you will you need to have observations that you need to have a change in NH, and to have observations that are uh, close in time. So what we got here is that actually the clouds generating uh, these like change in um in density. We're coming from 10 to the fours so of thousand or hundreds of parsec. So with, with these, we only get got like uh, an upper limit of the clouds distance. But um, I, I wanted to keep this slide because uh, this is to, to show you that like having any uh, var variation in NH is a powerful tool that can give us precious information on the total size and the clouds location. Even in this, even if in this case for this galaxy, we didn't have like very good numbers. I mean, we know the total is smaller than 500 uh, parsec. Um, so what this is the ongoing project, what we did is then uh, since like the, uh, the project on NGC 7479 gave us uh, uh, interesting, uh, interesting um, information, we uh, decided to expand uh, the, um, the sample and me and Nuria uh, Torres Alba here, uh, she's the postdoc following me, following me here in Clemson. We are analyzing the the other 30 sources of the of the of the sample and uh, so some preliminary results we're seeing here she already published the paper so if you're interested in reading your paper please take this reference uh Tar is about 2023 um in where she's um presenting half of the project uh, I am working on the paper to present the other half of the of the, of the project um, these are some preliminary results and these what I, I color coded here are the main behavior we've been seeing in the galaxies uh, so in some case we have here the density of the clouds so in this case and like in these two cases you see the clouds density is actually changing very quickly and uh, the clouds are denser than the torus. Um, then you have, but still Compton thin. Then you have in this case, where you have the density of the uh, still very similar to this, but you see you don't have any, any change in the density of the clouds. You have cases like NGC 7479 in where the, to the torus is denser than the, uh, than the clouds themselves but still the density of the clouds doesn't match the density of the torus. And you also have cases like this one in where the density of the clouds matches the density of the torus. So overall, what we can say is that what we see um, happening more often is that the column, den the, the, um, the line of sight column density, it's usually above or below the average column density of the torus. And this tells us the torus is actually clumpy. Uh, and also, it's like the 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 medium that is um, responsible for reflection, and the medium that is responsible for absorption are actually two separate regions inside the torus. I leave you. This is my team. Uh, this is uh, the team I'm working uh, with. Uh, it's divided in uh, Clemson and Enough. Enough is the Italian Institute of Astrophysics. Um, in um, these are people from uh, 
these are people from the University of Bologna. Uh, this is my, uh, the, the team I'm working here. Uh, this is, Mar this is uh, Professor Marco Iallo, is my advisor. Uh, Ross and Shuri are not in Clemson anymore. They got their PhD, so they moved out of here. And um, Nuria is my postdoc. And uh, yeah, there is me and Isaiah uh, otherwise working. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about our project here, there is a QR code you can you can uh, you can scan. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this talk and thank you for your attention.